In my videos, I've mostly covered America, with a sprinkling of other Western countries. But for this video, I want to turn to China. For those unfamiliar with modern Chinese history, there was a lot going on in China at this time. Those who know at least a little bit about China in this period are probably already laughing to themselves, imagining the confusion of the others. Like I said, things in China were extremely confusing and complicated politically and socially, but I'll do my best to explain things. I've been really interested in Chinese history for a while, so I really hope I can make things easier to understand. Anyways, enough of this intro, let's get into it. Since this is my first video about China in the 1920s, I feel like I have to explain the background of events leading up to then. First, let's go all the way back to 1911. This is the year that the Qing Dynasty was overthrown in a big revolution known as the 1911 Revolution, or the Xinhai Revolution. The Qing government was run by Manchus, an ethnic group from Mongolia that was distinct from Han Chinese, the most common ethnic group in China. The Manchus had been ruling China for more than 270 years by the time of the revolution. This is when China became a republic. Probably the most important leader of this movement was Sun Yat-sen, who became the first president briefly. He was followed by Yuan Shikai, pardon my pronunciation, who ironically named himself emperor of the newly created republic, which made many people lose faith in him and the new so-called republican movement. To make matters worse, in a time when Chinese nationalism was on the rise, Yuan caved to Japan's huge territorial demands in Shandong, Manchuria, and Fujian provinces. Yuan's actions caused resentment in many people, and many rebelled against his government, separating themselves into separate regional dominions. Yuan abdicated three months later, and died shortly after. But the damage was done. China had been fragmented into little domains who didn't recognize the republican government's laws or its authority. These regional warlords wanted control of the Beijing government and fought each other incessantly over it, but there was no definitive victor. This time period is known as the Warlord Era, and would continue well into the 1920s. There was continued popular unrest as China could not be unified, and demonstrations were frequent, the most important being the May 4th movement in the immediate aftermath of World War I. This was a nationalist movement, meaning that people, in this case mostly young students, wanted to see China regain its strength in order to be self-sufficient and be able to stand up against foreign imperialism. To do this, they insisted on adopting more western ideas and technology. And this is the backdrop for the northern expedition that began in 1926. Now we must introduce the most important figure in this event, Chiang Kai-shek. He would go on to have much greater importance later in his life but by the first half of the 1920s, he was simply a protege of Sun Yat-sen, who I mentioned earlier was a leading figure in the founding of the Chinese Republic. Unlike Sun, Chang had a military background, and was appointed by Sun as the commandant of the Wampoa Military Academy, established by Sun and backed by the Soviets for use by the Kuomintang. The Kuomintang, by the way, is the political party associated with Sun, Chang, and company. Like many political parties of its day, it had a big military wing, which was necessary for maintaining control. On March 12, 1925, Sun Yat-sen died of natural causes, which caused a scramble among leading members of the Kuomintang over who would secede him as leader. Officially, the Kuomintang was now controlled by two politicians in the party, but Chung, as the commandant of the official military academy of the party, had all the real power. And he was soon to exercise this power. Not against his rivals in the party, but in an ambitious attempt to unify China under his leadership of the Kuomintang Army, which was called the National Revolutionary Army. On June 6, 1926, Chung was appointed commander-in-chief of the entire army of the party. About a month later, on July 9, 1926, Chung set off with his forces. He faced a vast warlord army, with a combined total of about a million and a half men. But they were not coordinated, being spread across the eastern half of China and the warlord army was by no means a unified cohesive force. Not all of the warlords were allied together. And Chang had soldiers with more modern weapons and western military training, unlike the vast majority of the warlord's soldiers. So how did Chang plan on successfully completing this tremendous task of unifying the political mess that was China in the warlord era? If he could defeat the dozen or so warlords militarily, beat them into submission, or otherwise convince them to be absorbed into his proposed central government, China would once again be unified, 
and could finally begin its journey to becoming a world power once again. Cheng and the Kuomintang were based in the city of Guangzhou, located in southern China, roughly 1,300 miles south of Beijing, the historical capital of the country. That symbol of centralized government was their goal. From a symbolic and practical perspective, Beijing had to be captured and controlled. I won't go into too many details of the operation because it's long and complicated and filled with alliances, factions, breaks, and mergers. But here's a short summary. The National Revolutionary Army pushed west as well as east along the coast, and eventually captured important cities such as Shanghai and defeated the warlords who posed the biggest threat. Some of these warlords had formidable armies, numbering into the tens of thousands of troops, but they were still outnumbered by the National Revolutionary Army, especially as the campaign progressed and was bolstered by men originally from the warlords camps, who had either defected or had been absorbed into Cheng's army due to defeat and the subsequent assimilation of the warlords armies. By the end of February, Cheng's army numbered 700,000 men. Cheng would stop personally leading the expedition by mid-August 1927, but the campaign was not yet over. It would continue for more than a year. Even though nationalist victories were almost constant, they still came at a cost. By the fall of 1927, the National Revolutionary Army had lost 25,000 soldiers. And keep in mind, that was the winning side. The warlords' armies lost far more. Before the long journey to Beijing was complete, there were a few things that happened along the way that I think should be mentioned, things that would have consequences later on. The first of these involves the Chinese Communists. The Communists had formed in 1921, greatly influenced by the May 4th Movement, and had created a united front with the Kuomintang in 1924 against the warlords. Of course, both were just using each other to further their own agendas, and even though the Communist force was very small compared to his own, Chang thought the Communists were undermining his northern expedition, resulting in the Shanghai Massacre of 1927. Shortly after capturing Shanghai in April 1927, Chang declared martial law and ordered a purge of the Communists. They were disarmed and killed if they resisted, which many of them did. Then, when the Communists publicly spoke out against this betrayal of the United Front, they were summarily executed. Accurate numbers are very hard to come by but at least 300 and up to 5,000 communists were murdered. For a young party that hadn't gathered up significant strength just yet, this was a major blow, and they would not forget what Chang did to them. Suffice it to say, the United Front was over. This massacre was the main cause of the first all-out battle between nationalist Kuomintang forces and communist forces in Nanchang in August that same year. The communists retreated, but they would live to fight another day. The next incident involved Japanese forces in Shandong province in northern China. The root of this incident revolved around a dispute over the control of the Shandong Peninsula between Japan and China dating back to the Treaty of Versailles. The issue was eventually settled with the intervention of Western powers and China came out on top, but Japan maintained a presence in the area. Shortly after the National Revolutionary Army entered Jinan, the capital of Shandong, in late April 1928, they clashed with the Japanese soldiers stationed there. The exact cause is unknown, but it was likely rooted in the general dislike of each other. On May 3rd, Chinese soldiers killed Japanese soldiers and vice versa, eventually resulting in the murder of a Chinese diplomat by the Japanese. Chang had to intervene and apologize to the Japanese government and eventually things cooled down. But neither was finished with the other, and this was certainly not the end of their conflict, which would reach a fever pitch in the next decade. By the end of the northern expedition, Chang's army had grown with the inclusion of his defeated opponent's soldiers, and these combined forces marched into Beijing on June 6, 1928. By December, all the loose ends had been tied, and the expedition was officially over. China was officially unified, sort of, after a long and difficult journey. But although unification was technically achieved, it was by no means a happy ending for China. The next year, 1929, some of the warlords that Chang had made an alliance with earlier fought back when the nationalists tried to gain control of their armies. This rebellion was eventually put down when Chang bribed a large number of soldiers, whose loyalty was apparently very fickle, into joining the nationalist army. But for the sake of simplicity, China, or at least the most populated area, was basically unified. However, there were still no free elections and there was continued conflict and fighting and bad omens for the future. And just because Chang's army was victorious, that didn't mean that the people it had conquered were won over to their cause. They had simply been crushed into defeat. To the simple Chinese farmers that still lived a life similar to that of centuries before, all of this affected them little. 
they would continue to do what they had always done to survive. And if they were communists, well, there was nothing they could do but wait for now. For the majority of Chinese citizens, their loyalty to the new regime was unstable. Anti-foreign sentiments among the common people persisted, which was against the nationalist policy of modernizing with the help of Western technology, medicine, and science. I know what you're probably thinking. This doesn't really seem like unification, does it? But you have to use the term lightly in this case. Very lightly. But what the Northern Expedition absolutely did do was it solidified Chang's position as the leader of the nationalist Kuomintang party, and that was very important. But this is just the beginning of his story. This is also only the beginning of the long, bloody conflict between the nationalists and the communists, which would eventually lead to a final showdown between Chiang Kai-shek and his communist archenemy Mao Zedong. Okay, I know that was a lot to digest in such a short amount of time, but I hope you enjoyed this video anyway. Even though this was really just a surface level look into this event, it still took a really long time to collect all the information, so I hope the narrative was smooth enough. Let me know what you thought. At the very least, I hope this video shows that the 1920s was no golden age for China. There was little prosperity, and a lot of upheaval and merciless, seemingly endless violence. These bigger picture videos take so much longer than my normal videos, and making them can be quite exhausting, so I really hope you enjoyed it, or at least learned something interesting. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I'm really interested in modern Chinese history, so I might make more videos about China in the future. But for now, I think this one covered most of the main events, at least in a surface level way. As always, let me know your thoughts, comments, and suggestions. And if you know another interesting story about China in the 1920s that you want me to make a video on, let me know. Well, that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more tales from the Jazz Age.